Hey Randy, this is Chris back again. All right, so let's go ahead and pick up where we left off. We were just going through the uh, period table of elements. Hopefully we're good to go there. Remember the periods are horizontal rows, which tell us uh, if I have an, a an element or an atom in a certain period, that tells me that there are th that many energy levels. Um, so for example, if we look at boron, boron's in the second period, so there are two levels of energy, and it is in group three here, which means that three electrons are in the outer energy level or in the valence. Um, if we look at hydrogen, hydrogen has the first energy level, it's, and its electron is, it only has one electron in its valence shell. Um, if you go down to sodium, um, it has three energy levels, but only one of those, uh, only one electron is in the outermost energy level, or what we call the valence shell. Okay, so if you remember um, when we when we looked at this, we said that all of the noble gases have a full um, outer shell, a full valence shell, um, and at, for at least for the first part of the periodic table of elements, what we find is that if an element can get a total of eight electrons in its valence shell, okay, I, I occupy I put eight electrons into the valence shell here, um, the valence shell will be full. Okay, so if we look at this, if, you, if we look at um, neon, for example, okay, how many total electrons are we dealing with um, in that second shell? Well, I've got an electron here, an electron here, which, which occupy the s orbital, the, two, the two s orbital, and then that's two electrons, and then three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Ah, how about that? And all of these elements here in group eight that have eight electrons in their valence shell, with the exception of helium. Helium's the odd man out. And the reason being is that in the first energy level, since it can only ha have one orbital and I can only put two electrons in that orbital, it's full. So at two electrons, helium is full, it's happy. Um, and it is, that's why we put it in group E8, even though it doesn't have eight electrons, because um, the first energy level, the first period, could only have two electrons, okay? So helium acts just like all these other guys. That's why we put it here. Um, but all these other guys have eight electrons, okay? Neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon, etc. And that's what, is. so there's a kind of a general rule of thumb when dealing with S, and P block elements, okay? Um, the D block guys, the super sexy swingers, eh, not so much. Let's just deal with these guys for now. The S and P block elements are stable or happy when they have eight electrons in their valence shell, and that rule of thumb is something known as the octet rule, okay? Now, hydrogen and helium are the odd, odd ones out. They, they actually have to meet the duet rule, but that's it. All the rest of these guys here, okay, these guys here and these guys here, it, it, the, the rule of thumb is going to be eight um, for the most part. Okay, so with that in mind, the octet rule, atoms are happy when they can achieve what's known as octet stability. I can get eight electrons um, in the valence shell. Okay. Um, before we get too far into that, I just want to make sure you're okay on um, electron configuration. Um, so it, what you can do to kind of help, help yourself remember how to do that is just to kind of write on a piece of paper, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And this will help you with filling up um, your orbitals, okay? And then start at 1, 1s, okay? And then 2s, 3s, 4s, 5s, 6s, 7s. Okay, so these are my periods here. And basically what, what this is doing is saying, hey, look, every period has an s orbital associated with it, okay? And then what I do is I go down to 2, 2p, 3p, 4p, oops, 5p, 6p, 7p, okay? And then I move down to 3, okay? 
and I do 3D, 4D, 5D, 6D, 7D, and then I go down to 4, and 4F, 5F, 6F, 7F, okay? Just like that. These are my S's, these are my P's, these are my D's, and these are my F orbitals here. And then what I can do is, maybe I'll try to, I don't know if I have a different color or not, I maybe do this with pencil. Um, what I can do is, as I'm filling, as I'm looking at an element and I'm trying to find the electronic configuration of the element, what, what you, you want to do is you can just draw an arrow like this. Okay, and then draw another arrow like that. Okay, like that, like that, okay, like that, like that, and so on and so forth. So if we start at hydrogen, hydrogen is one electron, that's 1s. Helium is uh, two electrons. Uh, so 1s2, and then it's full at helium, and then I go down to lithium. Lithium, 1s2, 2s1, okay, and then beryllium, 1s2, 2s2, and the s orbital is now full, okay, and then I move to boron, 1s2, 1s2, 2s2, 2p1, okay, and then uh, carbon, 2p2, nitrogen, 2p3, oxygen, 2p4, fluorine, 2p5, neon, 2p6. All right. And now I move down to the third energy level, lithium. Okay, lithium. I, I ha, or, um, uh, uh, sodium, excuse me. So what do I have to do? Well, I have 11 electrons. I got to fill all these up first, right? The Aufbau principle. I got to start at so 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1, 3s2, okay, and then 3p1, 3p2, 3p3, 3p4, 3p5, 3p6, okay, and I filled up my p orbitals, right? And then what do I do? Going to move down to potassium. And then what am I going to do? I'm going to start at 1, and I'm going to fill all the way up. And so this is kind of a handy table that you can draw out to help you remember how the uh, filling levels occur. And uh, this is, of course, just writing out the uh, Aufbau principle. So this is just kind of a, a little guide that if you find helpful, you can use to do that. Okay, so let's go ahead and get back to the periodic table of elements. Okay, so if you noticed, uh, let's start over here, um, the group one. So the group one elements have one electron in their valence shell, and these are really special, and we actually call them alkaline, the alkaline earth metals. Okay, these are the alkaline earth metals. They only have one electron in their valence shell, because they're in group one, okay? With the exception of hydrogen. Hydrogen really is an alkaline earth metal, um, but we put it up there because it has one, and it acts It acts somewhat similar to these, but lithium, sodium, potassium, all the rest of the guys down here definitely are um, solidly a part of the alkaline earth metal. So let's just kind of see what's going on here. Okay, let's just look at lithium. So lithium has three electrons, and it has two um, energy levels. Let's just do the electron configuration for lithium. Okay, so lithium is 1s2, 2s1. Okay, um, that's the electronic configuration. So lithium has three protons. Okay, it's got an electron, an electron, and an electron here. Okay, there are my three electrons. Now, when we look at this, Going back to the octet and the duet rules, we got to ask yourself, is lithium happy? Okay, is it happy in this, in, in this configuration? The answer is no, because lithium wants to obey the octet rule, right? The octet rule. And 
let's see, what would we need to do for lithium to do that? Well, there are a couple things I could do. The first thing I could do is I could take lithium and I could add one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. If I put seven electrons here into the valence, okay, plus the one that it already has, it would have eight electrons. It would be happy. But the, but the way I think of elements, atoms, I think of them as going the path of least resistance. They're kind of lazy. So wouldn't it just be easier, wouldn't it be easier if lithium just got rid of this electron here? If, I, if it got rid of this outer electron, then it would... If I got rid of that one electron, lithium would have an electron configuration like helium. And would it be happy? Would it be a more stable atom? Absolutely, because the duet rule in this case would be met. Okay, so helium, uh, lithium, if it were to give up that one electron, okay, so let's say that it got rid of that electron, okay, it went off. So now I have two electrons, okay? It's now happy, but here's the thing. Um, once lithium does that, first of all, something needs to take this electron away from lithium, okay? This electron just isn't gonna go willy-nilly. Something actually needs to take it. And second of all, in this case, lithium is um, electrically neutral. All the positive charges Okay, so I have three positive charges in the nucleus. Those positive charges cancel out the negative charges. This is, so the overall charge on the atom is neutral. But in this case, that's not the case. I have lost a negative. I have lost an electron, so the positives now outnumber the negatives. There are, there, we have one more positive than I do negative, so the overall charge on lithium is positive. And when you look at labs and things like that, and when you talk about Li positive like that, what that is referring to is a lithium atom that has lost an electron. And when atoms lose or gain electrons, we call them ions. Okay, And when they lose electrons, they become positively charged, and we call those cations. And when they gain electrons and the overall charge on the atom is negative, we call them anions. Okay? So let's just take a look at sodium here. I want, want to look at sodium and I want to look at chlorine. Okay? And I want to compare and contrast those. Okay, so sodium. So sodium has an atomic number of 11. So sodium has 11 positives in the nucleus, all right? Sodium has three levels of energy because it's in the third period. So let's just go ahead and draw that. One, two, three. And I'm not going to draw the inner electrons, but it only has one electron here, and we know that underneath, if sodium were to lose an electron, it would have the configuration of neon. That'll, that it dropped down to the second, I'd have a total of how many electrons in the second shell? I'd have eight. So let's just go ahead and draw those in. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, and I like to pair them up, and that'll become important here in a little bit. Okay, so if if sodium were to lose this electron here, it would have underneath, in the shell underneath, it would have eight electrons and it would be happy. Okay, so let's just keep that in the back of your mind. And now let's go ahead and look at chlorine over here. Okay, chlorine is in the same period, so it has three energy levels. And let's just 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Chlorine has an atomic number of 17. Okay, so sodium, and here's chlorine here, it has 17 positive charges in the nucleus. It has one, two, three energy levels. Okay, and the valence shell of chlorine 
has seven electrons because it is in group seven. So let's go ahead and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so he, look at this. Chlorine only needs to get one electron to have its valence shell full. Sodium only needs to give away an electron. Well, what we have here is we have a match made in heaven. So sodium can give its electron to chlorine, okay? So when chlorine gains that electron, it now has a full valence, its octet rule is met. But because chlorine gained an electron, there are now more negatives and positives. So chlorine becomes chloride, Cl negative, because it gained an electron, and sodium becomes a sodium ion or cation because it lost an electron. And now what do we have? Well, I have a positively charged atom and negatively charged atom, and these atoms are going to be attracted to one another due to the loss and gain of electrons, and that is going to produce a molecule of sodium chloride, or what we call table salt. Okay? And whenever electrons gain, uh, whenever atoms gain electrons and become negatively charged, we change the name to you know, ide. Um, so chlorine would become chloride, fluorine would become fluoride, oxygen would become oxide. But when um, atoms uh, lose electrons, we don't change their name. So sodium is still called sodium, lithium is still called lithium, uh, magnesium, calcium, etc. Okay, so here's the cool thing. The cool rule of thumb is, is, is as follows. Um, atoms that like to lose electrons are called metals. Metals like to lose electrons, and atoms that like to gain electrons are called non-metals. Okay, so all of these guys here that only have one or two electrons in their, their valence shell, these are more than happy to get rid of their electrons. We call these metals here. And the most reactive metals are going to be the metals that only have one electron because that's all they need to get rid of. So they're really going to want to get rid of that electron. So lithium, sodium, potassium are highly reactive. Uh, beryllium, magnesium, and calcium are also um, uh, highly reactive as well. Okay. Um, so you almost never see things like potassium and sodium in their elemental form. You actually have to store them in um, oils and that to prevent them from reacting. Um, they're, so, they're so reactive. So we don't see these in our day-to-day -day life. Um, we, we, we typically see them as, as their ions. Um, now all of these guys over here though, like oxygen, fluorine, these guys here, these guys are all nonmetals, okay? These are nonmetals and they want to get a hold of electrons. So they love to, so when you take metals and nonmetals, they love to react, okay? They love to give and take. And when you have a give and take situation like this, the, a metal and a nonmetal bonding, binding together, we call that an ionic, an ionic bond, okay? So sodium chloride, potassium chloride. Um, lithium oxide, uh, magnesium oxide, uh, magnesium chloride, potassium chloride, et cetera, et cetera. Those are all ionic bonds. They're all ionic molecules. Okay, So that's the basic theory behind ionic bonding is a gain and a loss of electrons. Now, let's now talk about um, other ways that we can bond, okay? And um, on the periodic table of elements, there's actually a little stair step area right, right about right in here. And basically what the stair step is, uh, is uh, saying that everything from here over to here is considered a metal, and then this is all these are all considered non-metals. And then the, the elements that are right next to the little stair step, or what we call the metalloids, they're kind of semi-metals, and they can kind of kind of go either way, depending on, on the situation. Okay, now there's another kind of bonding um, that can occur other than ionic bonding. So um, let, uh, let's ask ourselves the question, um, 
we're good with metals and nonmetals, but what if nonmetals and nonmetals? What 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 about nonmetals and nonmetals? Um, let's take oxygen for example. Okay, let's 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 take oxygen. Um, does oxygen want to give electrons or take electrons? Well, oxygen wants to take electrons, but let's say that I have oxygen and I put it next to another oxygen atom. Okay. Well, they're both atoms that really want to take electrons, so neither one is going to be particularly keen on, um, on giving their electrons up, okay, because that would make them more unstable. So instead, what you're going to have happen, so when you have nonmetals, nonmetals plus nonmetals, instead of uh, giving and taking electrons, instead of ionic bonding, you get sharing sharing of the electrons and when I have sharing of electrons I have another kind of bond and that bond is known as a covalent bond so let's just let's just take a look at um, oxygen here okay Can you wait for that thing to go by Pretty loud still. I'll wait for those guys to head on out of here. Um, it's kind of funny. Uh, it, when I came in this morning, it was dead quiet, and then as soon as I started doing this, it, uh, the sound really picked up. Okay, that sounds better. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take two oxygens. All right, so let's oxygens in the um, the second period here, and it is in group one, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Oxygen is in group six here. Okay. Oxygen is in group six. So what does that tell me? That tells me that if I look at oxygen, okay, so here's an oxygen, and then the nucleus has a total of eight protons, eight positives, and I'm just now going to look at the valence shell. I'm going to forget about all the other shells and just look at the valence shell. And how many electrons do I have? Well, I have six electrons in the valence shell. So one, two, three, four, okay, five, six. And I always, when you fill, when you draw this, I always try to draw um, the electrons paired up, okay. And when, what, and the reason we do that is when you start filling up orbitals. Um, and uh, maybe I should have drawn this drawn this earlier, but um, when you when you fill up your orbitals. Let's just do the, the electron configuration for oxygen, okay? So if you remember, oxygen has eight electrons, okay? So um, let's start uh, at the 1s2, and then 2s2, all right? So that's 2, 4, so that's 4 of the 8. So I have 2p4, okay? So 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, okay? If we actually look at the individual orbitals, okay, so I, my s orbital can hold a total of two electrons, total of two electrons there, and then the p orbitals, how many p orbitals do I have? Well, I have three p's, right? So I have the px, the py, and the pz orbital, and each of those orbitals can hold two electrons, like so, okay? So, um, electrons have this, this quantum nature about them called spin. Um, it's, it's, it's a purely quantum mechanical phenomena. And they can either have plus one half or minus one half spin, or up or down is kind of a, a, an easy way of thinking spin up or spin down. Okay? Um, so when the electrons fill the s orbital, um, what will happen is. One electron will go here, spin up, one will go down. And they pair up together with their spins up and down. Okay? I could not put two electrons in the s orbital with the same exact spin, spin up like that, because remember that Pauli's exclusion principle says you can't have electrons of the same quantum state. Well, if I had both electrons in there with uh, this same spin that would violate the exclusion principle. So it has to be spin up and spin down. Okay, same thing here. Spin up, spin down, and now let's go ahead and fill the two 
uh, the p orbitals. Okay, and this is where that Hund's rule comes into play. Okay, so it would be really easy when we fill the p orbital just to go, well, I'm going to fill the px first. And so I'm going to put a spin up, spin down like so, and a spin up, spin down like so. Okay, and there are my four electrons. Sounds reasonable, right? They're pairing up, but here's the thing. Electrons don't like to be near each other. So what the electrons are going to do is instead of pairing up that way, in the, in the case of the p orbitals, um, the electrons, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put an electron into each orbital. So one, two, three, okay? Because the electrons want to be far away from each other, so each uh, one electron is going to go into each orbital. And once each orbital has one electron with a spin-up state, then the electrons are going to kind of be like, oh, all right, if I have to be next to him, and then I'll go in, spin down, spin down, spin down. It's kind of like filling a bus, right? Uh, people that get on the bus want to be as, as far apart as possible. That's known as the Huns rule. And again, that has to do with the quantum nature of things. So when we fill these p orbitals, um, each orbital gets a spin up electron first, and then they start backfilling. So this is actually what um, oxygen looks like here. Okay, so um, that's why um, we kind of draw them paired up here. So here are like my paired um, s electrons. Okay, because this is this whole area here, the, the second shell, that's my valence shell. So these are my s electrons right here. These are my p electrons that are paired. And I have a p electron by itself and a p electron by itself here. Okay, so that's kind of why I drew that um, that way. Okay, so I'm going to take this oxygen here. And I'm going to take another oxygen here with eight. All right. One, two, three, four, five. Six. All right. And what do you think is going to happen in this case? They don't. They're not going to be able to take electrons because they're both nonmetals. But what they can do is, this oxygen can say to this oxygen, "Hey, how about we share an electron here?" Okay. If we share an electron, then I can pretend like I have seven. I can pretend like I have seven. Okay, we're almost at eight. Can we do better than that? Oh yeah, how about we share these two single electrons here? And now I can pretend like I have eight, and I can pretend like I have eight. And when you get this sharing, every time you have a sharing of electrons, that's a bond. So oxygen, okay, this is another way of drawing oxygen, these little lines mean a bond. Oxygen has a double covalent bond, okay? If we look at something like helium or hydrogen okay so hydrogen just has one electron here's hydrogen okay hydrogen would like to get two electrons right if I put these two hydrogen molecules next uh, atoms next to one another this guy could be like hey let how about you share your electron with me and I'll share my electron with you and we can both pretend like we have two and that would make a H2 molecule two atoms of hydrogen or hydrogen held together by a single covalent bond. Um, let's just, just look at nitrogen for the heck of it, okay? So here is um, nitrogen, and um, let's see if we can pull our little periodic table back up, um, talk about nitrogen. Ah, let's just do, um, so I have nitrogen, I have nitrogen, and we will go ahead and uh, compare and contrast um, the nitrogen atoms. And I want to pull up a periodic table for you just to, uh, um, just to kind of go through um, looking at the table. So here's nitrogen, seven electrons. Let's see if I can, there we go. Nitrogen, seven electrons. It's in the second energy. And nitrogen is in group five, so it has five. Um, electrons and its valence. So nitrogen is going to look like this. One, two, three, four, five. Nitrogen. One, two, three, four, five. 
Okay, so we put these two nitrogens together, and atoms, and again, they're like, hey, let's share. All right, so let's share. And let's share here. All right, okay, so he's sharing two, he's sharing two. Okay, that's seven electrons. Ah, oh, but he have a, still have a single electron out here all by itself. Let's share these two here. All right, and now I have a triple covalent bond between nitrogen, and now I have a molecule of N2, or nitrogen gas. All right. And so that is the um, basic understanding behind um, both ionic bonding and covalent bonding. And I think I'm going to go ahead and cut it off here. All right, take care.